Um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this, this talk is hosted by Citrus, co-hosted by Citrus and TIER. My name is Melissa Ho. I'm a member of the TIER Research Group, and I actually worked with Keshev um, at Ensign Corporation and was one of his students back at Cornell. Um, S. Keshev is an associate professor and Canada Research Chair in Tetherless Computing at the School of Computer Science, University of Waterloo, Canada. Earlier in his career, he was a researcher at Bell Labs, an associate professor at Cornell, and co-founder of Ensign Corporation, a Silicon Valley startup. He's the author of a widely used graduate textbook on computer networking, and has been awarded the Director's Gold Medal at IIT Delhi, the Sackerson Prize at UC Berkeley, and the Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship. His current interests are in infrastructural issues underlying tetherless computing. Keshev re received a BTEC from the Institute of Indian Institute of Delhi in 1986 and a PhD from University of California Berkeley in 1991 both in computer science. Welcome Keshev. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm trying to keep I'll try and keep this talk actually fairly short because uh, this is an audience where I'd like to actually get some feedback. So, uh, I'll have plenty of time for questions and of course you should feel free to interrupt me as well. Um, all right, so what I'm going to talk to you about, oh, I should say, this is a talk on behalf of 20, 23 people, something like that. So just to show you, a lot of people have worked on KiosNet. So even though I'm talking about it, it really is a team effort. All the people on the left are basically my grad students, and then these are all my undergrad interns over the last four and a half years. So this is something that's been going on for quite a long time. Um, KiosNet in a nutshell, has got, it's got, just got two parts to it, the computation part and the communication part. And the computation part is, how do you provide computing at very low cost? And it has to do, uh, and the way we do it is we have what we call a kiosk controller. It's a Socrus box. Some of you have seen it, it's of a lunch, uh, the size of a lunch box. has essentially no moving parts other than a, other than a hard drive. And uh, it can take a lot of heat and dust and, and so on. Uh, and off of it, we have uh, these thin clients. I should say thin, not thin client, not thin server. The server is thin too, but the clients are thinner. And uh, these, uh, these provide the computation. I'll, I'll describe that in some more detail. And the other half of it is the communication part where we essentially use what we call opportunistic communication between the kiosk controller and some uh, vehicles to carry data back and forth. So, so that's it. You know? So if all you remember is what's kiosk, then it has two parts to it. The, how do you do computation and how do you do communication? So just to kind of give you an idea what it looks like, uh, I'm, well, actually, I'm going to talk about the goals first, and I'll tell you what it looks like. So what are the goals? And my slides are really simple because I can't think very complicated things. First thing, low cost. Okay. Cost drives everything in the design. Okay. We want to get everything to be as low cost as possible because we want to target people who can't pay much. So if you want to give somebody a high cost solution, it's great. You just give them a satellite phone at $5 a minute, they can be anywhere in the world, it will work. So high cost is easy to achieve. But when you say low cost, it changes every single design decision because you can't even afford necessarily to have new hardware to buy recycled hardware. You can't afford to have any, any breakages because that costs maintenance and you know, it costs people to fix things. So as you'll see, the low cost goal really drives a lot of decisions. The second goal is robustness. We want something to just work. You deploy it, it just works. You don't have to think about it, you don't have to worry about it, it just works. And the reason is because what we're trying to do is to provide communication to people who are not technically savvy. Okay? To give somebody, uh, if somebody is technically savvy, you can do a complex solution, something that's not very really robust because they can fix it. Right? But if somebody is not technically savvy, you can't give them something that's complex. So a lot of work goes into making things robust. So robustness is the second goal. The third goal is security. But this is something that you may find surprising. Why do you want to bring security right in, up front into a low cost solution? And the reason is because I believe and you know, is that, that people don't want to uh, give away the data, give away the information, give away the transactions to things that they perceive to be insecure. As you see in a minute, one of the things we do is that the kiosks transmit data through vehicles. But what happens if the guy starts looking through your stuff? In a kiosk, uh, or a, I guess uh, you may call it an internet cafe, uh, how do you know the cafe owner isn't browsing through all your data? So if you want to, if you want to support things like financial transactions, e-banking, you need to have security from the ground up, and so that's another goal over here. And finally, flexibility. 
And what I mean by that is that we want to build a solution which forms the communication and the computation part for a large number of deployments. We don't want to have a special purpose uh, you know, ex solution that does exactly one thing and does that one thing well. We want to build essentially a computation and communication system which can be used for a large number of different uh, things. You know, you could use it for telemedicine, you could use it for uh, col data collection in, you know, in remote areas, you could use it for disseminating uh, videos, you could use it for uh, uploading uh, uh, songs and movies and so on and so forth. So all of these things should be supported. So that's flexibility. So, okay, so this is what it sort of looks like, just to give you an idea of things. What we have here is a picture of a, a, a deployment we did in the field about two years ago. And this is the kiosk building, that's this big building over here. And we have this kiosk controller, that's a lunchbox size thing, it's about this big. And that kiosk controller is powered by, in this case, a solar panel, which I'm showing over here. This guy on the roof setting up the solar panel. And that solar panel actually, what it does is it charges up a car battery, okay? Because a car battery uh, turns out to be something people know how to use in villages. They charge it up for, for actually powering TVs. So if you say, I want a car battery charged up, they know what to do. So we use a car battery, we can use a solar panel, that's kind of optional. And then that powers the kiosk controller. I think I lost my mouse. And, oh, yeah, okay. And that powers the kiosk controller over here. And then what we do is that from this kiosk controller, we have an antenna going out to the roof over here, an external antenna which I show on top. And we have an external antenna can attach to a vehicle. And whenever the vehicle is in range, we opportunistically upload data to the car. So this basically is an idea we stole from the Darknet project, which was done at MIT back in 2001. And uh, what happens next is that the, uh, inside the kiosk, we have this recycled PC over here. We just basically got a recycled PC from a, from, a, from a store which sells junk PCs, paid $50 for it. And as you'll show in a minute, what we do is we just attach the PC to the kiosk controller, as I've shown over here, and we just boot it. That's all we need to do, attach it and boot it up, and it comes up running Linux, running uh, essentially clean, virus-free certified software, and that provides things like email and other things we'll talk about in a bit. That PC then stores data in the kiosk controller, and whenever the bus or vehicle goes by, the antenna on top of that kiosk is going to send it to the vehicle. Now the vehicle is shown over here again, and what we did was we just took a wire from the car battery over here and put it into the into <laughs> inside, and that yellow foam actually has another kiosk control, another controller box which has a hard drive stores data, and we have a magnetically mounted antenna right over here. The vehicle drives to a city. And in the city, we have an antenna kind of dangling out of this window over here. And what it does is that it trans transfers the data into this kiosk controller sitting over here, and eventually into essentially a back-end system. This is a, this is a, in this case, this is the rural development office in Vishakhapatnam, which is where we did this, and they get the data. So what we've shown essentially in, 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 over here is the ability, at least in terms of hardware, of being able to transfer data from disconnected villages which have essentially no infrastructure necessary. You know, they don't need towers, they don't need trenches. You just have a box and you have something driving past and you can send data back and forth. That's basically the communication in a nutshell. And uh, you know, if you can get it to work, you can get it deployed, you are able to essentially uh, bridge the communication gap for regions which cannot afford anything more. Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the idea. In a more uh, elaborate deployment, you would have something like this. You would have essentially this dash line over here shows a bus route, and you'd have perhaps a bus that goes round and round. And at each of these kiosks over here, you would actually be able to uh, have users who are able to send and receive data when the bus goes past. What the bus is going to do is to give it to a gateway, which could be uh, uh, essentially a, a store which has a DSL connection or somebody has a DSL connection and a, and a communication device, a wireless device, and that would send data to a proxy, and then from the proxy it can go to some legacy server, for example, an email server that would be getting email. We also contemplate, though we haven't yet supported, mobile devices that could communicate directly with the bus or could communicate with the kiosk controller in one of the kiosks, and therefore would be able to provide information to, the, to, the mobile, to these mobile devices. For example, you can imagine somebody who wants to get uh, an agricultural video, like Digital Green Project, and they want to get it on the cell phone because they want to watch it on the, on, on the cell phone. 
So you would, the proxy would pick up the information, send it down to the gateway, to the bus, it would go and be stored at the kiosk. Whenever the mobile user walks past, it would be uploaded to the mobile device, and they'll be able to watch it. So that is the use case. And we, uh, we, we don't have that working just yet, but at least we contemplate doing that by the end of the summer. The rest of the stuff basically works. So I want to now step back a little bit and go through how do we achieve these goals of low cost and security and robustness and so on. And I'm just going to walk you through kind of a high level uh, description. And what I'd like to do is, you know, if you have any questions, I can go through it in some more, in some more detail. So how do you get low cost? Well, cost really comes in two parts. The upfront cost, the capital expenditure or capex, and the monthly cost or opex. How do we reduce capex? You know, yesterday was Earth Day, so I stole the thing. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Reduce, re reduce means you know, just have as, as few things as you need to have. Don't have anything extra. All you need to get started in this solution is a kiosk controller and a recycled PC. Okay, and you can get, a, you can get that and basically you're up and running for, as far as the kiosk is concerned. In terms of the communication uh, system, we, we need one of these boxes on one vehicle, and then we need one gateway. So the total cost of setting the whole thing up, including everything, is in the ballpark of $1,000. Okay, maybe it's, it depends on volume, et cetera, but $1,000 or so, and you can have one. Uh, the first will set up. Each additional one is roughly the $300 range, depending on how you, how you source things. Three hundred to five hundred dollars, depending on how you do it. So, each additional kiosk. So the first kiosk costs you thousand bucks, and each additional one is about three hundred to five hundred. Okay. So that's the incremental cost for the deployment. Because you just need to put a recycled PC about fifty dollars, one of the Socrus boxes between two hundred and three hundred dollars, depending on how you configure it, an antenna, and a car battery, and that's it. Um, reuse. So. What we're doing over here, the, the reuse part is a bit tongue in cheek because what we're really saying, the reuse part is we, we, the same code runs everywhere. We actually have the same uh, stack, the same opportunistic communication happening between the kiosk and the bus and the bus and the ferry and so on. So we have one single code base. We just can instantiate it everywhere. And actually, it turns out the same code base also runs on iPhones and, and, and cell phones and so on because we also support, we, we have some research in opportunistic communication between, between cell phones and between cell phones and infrastructure. And so the same code that runs on an iPhone also runs in the village. And we kind of reuse our research uh, in both places. And recycle, we're big in recycling. All the PCs are recycled. And we also support the use of recycled cell phones as SMS devices in kiosks. So you can send SMS, a shared SMS uh, service from kiosks to cities by attaching a, a recycled cell phone to the, to the kiosk controller. So, that's the, so by doing all this, you reduce the capital expenditure. You know, we, we, we don't have that many, things, not that many things to buy. In terms of operation expense, uh, we don't have any spectrum that is licensed. There is no GPRS, there's no WiMAX. Necessarily, you know, to get the basic thing going, you just basically have to pay for somebody to fix things, because things will, things will go wrong. So we estimate, uh, based on uh, talking to some uh, people who run uh, kiosks, that uh, one field technician can, sell, can maintain about 20 kiosks. So you can take 120 of the salary of a field technician, and that's what it costs in terms of field technician. The two other operating expenses, one is loan payments, because typically the kiosk owner would be buying the equipment with a loan and you know, a micropayment, micropayment kind of thing, and they would be paying some loans. And then we expect everything to die after 18 months, just because the heat will kill it. And so depreciation has to be rolled, uh, put into account. If you do all of this, it turns out that you still can do a reasonably uh, low cost deployment. So it might get. Right, right. Okay, so the, the, I guess the question is, if you have, uh, if you have uh, uh, cheap PCs, they're going to die more often, so your capex is low, but your opex is higher. And um, I don't know about that, because what I've been seeing more and more is that the amount of recycled e-waste, if you want to call it that way, it just keeps growing, right? About 100 million PCs at least are junked every year, probably more. And so the amount of spare parts lying around, if you see these pictures of these warehouses, of re, uh, you know, they're just ceiling to floor stacked with motherboards and mice and this and that. So even if you're getting these junk pieces and you throw stuff away, you can, more new stuff is being generated almost faster than you can use it. So uh, people now pay money to have PCs taken away from them. Okay. So, 
So getting, uh, putting in new cards and so on, this is something that people seem to know how to do even in fairly remote areas. Uh, unlike OLPC, which is everything is whizzy new stuff that nobody knows how it works. In fact, they also didn't, don't know how the keyboard works, it turns out. Uh, <laughs> everything here is tried and tested, and we have no new stuff. Everything is actually circa 2001. And so if it breaks, you know, you just go down the street and you buy some more junk and you stick it in and it works. So that's sort of how the, well, just how we do the uh, recycle stuff. Yeah. When you have to replace things, for example, the kiosk controller is in the vehicle as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, have you seen any damage because of it being in the vehicle because of bad roads, or is that foam thing that it's stuck in enough? Yeah. How often you, would you might have to replace that? Or? Okay, so the, the, uh, the, for the trials that we did, the foam seemed to be enough. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, we need to, you know, we, we don't know if it's adequate for longer uh, periods. Uh, Going forward, the next thing we're trying to do is basically have the ferry carries data on a cell phone. So all you have is somebody's cell phone in the pocket. The driver has a cell phone in his pocket or her pocket, and that's all you need to ca carry stuff. And then uh, some of those vibration and other issues go away. So that's at least one way forward. Okay, okay so the next thing is how, what, how about robustness? So to do robustness, we use a several, uh, several design, uh, several t t t techniques. So the first one is we assume that the buses are going to get lost, the data is going to get lost. So we use what's called flooding-based routing. And let me explain how that works from this picture over here. Essentially, the kiosk will have potentially multiple vehicles going past them. And the kiosk gives data to all the ferries going past, all of them. And so they're multiple copies. And the, anything that's going to be sent to the kiosk is given to every ferry from the gateway, by one of the gateways as well. So as long as any one of the ferries makes it to the kiosk, any of the kiosks it get connect, gets connectivity. So we are kind of hedging our bets over here. And the reason we can do that is because it doesn't really cost very much to make a vehicle enabled. You, know, you just have to have some device on it. And if you can put one more, you get you know, twice the robustness. Yes. Are you doing any multi-hop? If you have a bus that goes by your house and then that meets another bus that goes by a gateway, are you able to handle that? No, we're not. We have contemplated doing that, and you know the flooding-based system could do it, but uh, for most typical deployments, you probably don't need to do multi-hop, and debugging it is a nightmare, so <laughs> we aren't doing it. Uh, it's a nice theoretical problem, but in practice, we don't anticipate it's going to happen very often. So, so the first thing is, is, is for robustness really is you know just have multiple network paths. The second thing is that whenever, data, whenever the kiosk controller or a ferry or a gateway receives data, it puts it immediately into a database, into a Postgres database. And so if any of the nodes dies, you know, power fails, you pull the plug out, somebody accidentally steps on it and the power gets disconnected, all of which we've done in the lab by now, Everything is still there. It's all in the database. And you know, unless the database is heavily corrupted, we basically have robustness. So once it gets into the device, it pretty much stays there uh, you know, until it gets delivered. Uh, and we have tested this quite extensively. So it gives us a certain amount of confidence in saying, OK, just put it there, and you know, nothing is in memory. Everything is in the database. So that, that helps. The third thing is the kiosk controller is what I call hardened. We didn't do this. We just bought these Socrates boxes, which happen to be really quite amazing devices. We put them in 50 degrees centigrade temperatures, and they continue to work fine. You know, they have no fans. Uh, and so the kiosk controller is not a regular PC. It's this small embedded system device, which is engineered to take the heat. And you know, that, I think, is a good idea. And finally, the terminals, where you actually get service from. So if you get email in a room, it's a recycled PC, we call it a terminal. It's expected to fail. We expect them to fail. And so we have nothing on them. They have, uh, all they have really is, uh, that all this, the only thing we use is the CPU, the keyboard, and the mouse, and the display. All right? And so we don't actually use the hard drive on that recycle. You can take out the hard drive. It doesn't matter. So the hard drive can fail. The CD-ROM can drive. The CD-ROM drive can fail, it's not a problem, it'll just work. So uh, these things are the ones which are recycled. They are going to die, but that's okay. You know, let them die. You know, we'll just replace the parts if, the, if it happens. So 
all the state gets concentrated in the chaos controller, which is hardened, and so we basically get robustness. As, it's as robust as the chaos controller, which we hope to be fairly robust. Okay. Uh, any questions about this? All right. Now, how about security? Um, so if you want to support things like financial transactions or banking, we believe that there has to be security from the ground up. And the way we do it is to build our own PKI, our own public key infrastructure. And PKI has gotten a bad rap over the years because uh, people think it's hard to do, and it is hard to do. It's hard to do when you, have, when you don't have a single trusted third party. Okay. Let's say VeriSign ruled the world and everybody had a VeriSign certificate, then PKI is easy because everybody trusts VeriSign, VeriSign signs everything, and you know, you just you know, follow the certificate chain, and you can use open source software lying around which does everything for you, which is exactly what we do. We, we uh, have this trust model that says that the person deploying this is somebody that everybody trusts, okay, they're providing the service to the, to, the, to the users. And so that single trusted third party basically certifies all the keys, and at this point, just standard out of the textbook encryption uh, allows you to uh, essentially get data back and forth. Uh, in addition, what we do is that uh, it turns out to prove some of the security properties it becomes necessary to ensure that the kiosk controller's hard drive cannot be removed and tampered with. And we spent a long time you know, trying to figure out what to do, and then the solution presented itself. It's just trivial. Put it inside a lock box, actually a box with a lock on it, and you know, take the key away. And a simple solution like this turns out to be far uh, more secure than very, very complex software schemes you came up with. So as, if you can't remove the hard drive, then many things become possible. And so the kiosk control is physically secured. The only thing coming out of it really is the Ethernet cable and you know, in, in a box that you lock. Uh, the terminals, when they mount the file systems, because after all, they don't have their own hard drive, they have to mount NFS mount file systems. Actually, they mount encrypted file systems. And these encrypted file systems are provided uh, by the kiosk controller, uh, but the only way to decrypt them is the user's password. So when the user is created, with that particular password, the user has a password, and only that user can read his or her, or her files. So the user does not need to trust the kiosk owner. So this is unlike today's internet cafes, by the way, where if you go to an internet cafe and you use an internet cafe computer, you can be pretty sure, or, or you should say, you, you're, not, you're never sure that there isn't a key logger, which is logging all your keystrokes and gathering all your passwords or doing far worse things to you. This actually is far more secure because uh, the, the, the kiosk owner is unable to install any new applications. In fact, they're prevented from doing so, and also they cannot read any, any files. So we, we have that kind of built in. So security is kind of built in, and you know, there's some, quite a few papers and so on I can point you to, which explain the security architecture in great detail. Okay. And then flexibility, so we, while we started out with using this notion of you know, vehicles to carry data, we aren't wedded to the idea. So we allow actually the kiosk controller to use any available connection. So if there's WiMAX, fine. If you have long range Wi-Fi, fine. You have SMS, GPRS, Edge. Any combination of acronyms, we can use it, okay? And so, because it's opportunistic, we just have to have TCP IP running on that. It's pretty much what's always there. And so we can just use it. So that's what we mean by any available connection. So we're happy to use dial-up if you have dial-up. If you have uh, anything, we can use it. Um, so I know there's a lot of work here going on long range wireless. So the way it would work is that the, we could just take kiosk controller and provide all the user management, all the security, all the uh, robustness that we get, uh, all the user management that we have, and simply use long range wireless to the back end, and that would just work you know, out of the box. Uh, in terms of the nodes, any node that runs JVM, a Java virtual machine, can be used as a ferry. So we've got it working on uh, laptops and f desktops and uh, Asus EEPCs and iPhones and Nokia tablets. Basically, pretty much anything today that runs JVM 142 or above, we can use it. And uh, that's a lot of things. Uh, to get flexibility, we view this technology as not solving one problem, but as solving many different problems by providing essentially a lowest common denominator between uh, kiosks and internet cafes, which is the communication and basic communi uh, computation. And so what we have is a, a way to develop applications is, is very simple. It's so simple, I don't even need a slide to show you. What we do is we, each application essentially has a directory called an upload directory. And when it wants to upload something, it just drops a file there. And it appears after some period of time in a corresponding directory at the proxy. 
and after that you do what you want. So if you go back to this picture over here, the application developer simply knows how to drop a file in and expect it to come out of the proxy and then they need to write a plugin that says what do you do with it. For example, one of the applications he developed, which is email, so you drop a file in over here, it pops up with the proxy that looks at the destination and sends it to destination email server. So you can have these guys have Gmail accounts, for example. This works. You can send and receive Gmail to these devices without any problem in a kiosk. Um, and so this, this notion, we also, have the, we also have a developed application for YouTube videos to be uh, picked up by the proxy from YouTube, sent down to the ferry, and then you can subscribe to them on the kiosk and receive YouTube videos. You can also upload YouTube videos, and that just also just works. Uh, we can also synchronize any database that's present at the proxy to these nodes over here, so you can up the, update the data, any database or any information at the proxy and have it appear at all the kiosks, essentially mirroring it. But the directory-based API uh, just um, seems to be quite easy to use. We have undergrads come in who have no idea what the system does. We tell them how to use the directory-based API. It's a how-to file with about you know, 20 lines describing it, and they're off and running new applications, essentially a couple of hours later. So that seems to work really well. And the best part is it, uh, security comes out of the box. So when, it, when you drop a file into a directory, it figures out the public key of the destination from the uh, white pages directory uh, database which you keep locally, and automatically does all the encryption, et cetera. So, uh, for somebody to write a secure app, they don't need to know anything about security. All they need to know is drop it into this directory. It will be secure all the way until the proxy and then do what you want at the other end. And that provides over there security. Security means that the, the kiosk owner cannot see your data and it cannot be intercepted, tampered with, etc. all the way. So privacy and integrity are provided out of the box. So that gives us the flexibility to develop new apps. So. That's basically all I'm going to talk about with respect to technology right now, unless there are any questions and I can kind of dive in deeper. Uh, so, before, so before I kind of end that, are there any other questions about, about this? Uh, yeah. Um, I had one question about the epidemic flooding algorithm. Yeah. How do you actually expire messages from the system? Okay, so essentially every message that's created has a time to live that's set by the creator of the message, and then when that expires, we essentially have a process in the database uh, which examines the database, selects all the expired bundles, and deletes them. And so are you not, you're not worried about the cell phones filling up with data if they're the ones that are actually holding? If you're using a phone, for example, as your courier, yeah. um, presumably there's some trade-off between how long it might take for the data to be delivered and then... Yes, it is. It's an unsolved, it's a unsolved research problem about how to choose the expiration times, right? So right now, we, uh, we, we don't know. I mean, I, I don't think, we don't know and nobody knows. And that's something we'll be looking, we're looking to sort of the next round of work. But uh, for the, for the Socrus boxes, we have 40 gigabytes of storage, sure. which you anticipate is fine. iPhones, we have 16 gigabytes or 8 gigabytes. So that should be okay, especially if you can get devices with uh, built, you know, with uh, extendable cards. So the Blackberries come with uh, SD cards, which can go up to, I think, 8 or 16 gig right now. Uh, yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Yes. Uh, your, your, your focus here is obviously developing regions, but the seems to apply this kiosk net like more broadly. You could put it like in Berkeley, for instance, in places. Yes. Um, have you looked at that? Has your group yes. looked at? Yeah. We have absolutely looked at that. I mean, uh, the the low cost part is focused on developing countries and the user management and so on and so forth. But the ability to buffer up data and have it picked up later on is something that uh, you know, sensor network people have looked at for collecting, say, you know, pollution measurements or water quality measurements. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, are, we are going to start working with some water quality people who are interested in this. Uh, and, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's just a question of where do you focus your efforts on, and we haven't really gone very far on that. But if the people are interested, we'd be happy to work with them. Okay. Yeah. So everything we're doing is open source and open everything, so you, know, you can download it and start using it. So each, um, each controller is running an instance of Postgres, and that's where it stores the data? Or? Correct. Okay. Yeah, one it's, it's a, it's a, each controller is running Debian, and uh, they have, we have Postgres running on it. And also, yeah, that's right. And also the ferries are running Postgres. And uh, on the, on the uh, iPhones, we, oh, I don't know, I think SQLite or something. I don't know what you're using. But we, we, we broke into it. 
Any particular reason, uh, design decision for Postgres as opposed to My students else? liked it. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, they write the codes if they say they like. We had used MySQL earlier, and for some reason they like Postgres better. Uh, we were doing some, some interesting things with, for database synchronization. We were doing dumps, and we're doing differences on the dumps. And Postgres has better support for deltas than MySQL. So we use Postgres. Got it. Yeah. Uh, any other questions about this? So I have to say, you know, you saw this, 28 people on this. So there's quite a bit of depth underneath this, and there's a lot of papers and so on on our website. So I'm just trying to give you the big mental picture, and you know, we can drill down all you want uh, into this. So what's the status? We, we were very worried, at least I was very worried, that we wouldn't be able to survive the, the dust and the heat and the vibration and the temperature and all this stuff. So the first version, we basically put all these Socrates boxes and tried to test it in a village in India in summer. And the hardware worked, the software didn't. <laughs> okay. So the software was, uh, it required a grad student to look at it all the time. If you looked away, it would die. So you know, we realized that we need to fix our software. So we've been really fix, uh, fixing it. The second version we released in July 2007, we had everything working except security. And, uh, and actually, we didn't have persistence. We didn't have a database. And uh, that version actually is being used by this startup company done by two students out of IIT Kharagpur called Kranti. And they're basically using this code to provide rural uh, communication. Uh, at least that's what the press release says. I haven't really followed up on them, but they're using a code. The third release, third version is going to be released pretty soon. I'm the QA guy, and since I'm here, I can't be testing it. And so uh, as soon as I go back, we'll finish it. But uh, it adds security, it adds a data, uh, database. We had been using the DTN uh, code base, uh, 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 but it turned out that for several reasons we, we, we had to, we wanted to move to our own solution. So we have replaced the DTN reference implementation with the Java based implementation of DTN that is part of this. And uh, Ravina Luck, who, is, who did her master's here and actually did her bachelor's at Waterloo, uh, spent some time uh, in my lab uh, until recently. And next week she's going to Ghana. And she's deploying a sort of variant of her code. She doesn't need the security, she says. So she's in security, but uh, she's deploying essentially a second version in, in, that, uh, in that system with some additions. So that's the status. What did we learn? <laughs> the first thing we learned was to publish academic papers, you need complexity. To succeed in real life, you need simplicity. <laughs> okay. So our first solution, we had a paper back in 2000, I don't know, 2004 or something, a paper design. We had distributed hash tables. We had flat names. We had identity-based cryptography. We, had, we were fully buzzword compliant and basically not working. You know, it, was, it was not even high speed, not, it was low speed, not working. Okay. So, so these are cool but impractical. So all of these are gone. So we replaced distributed hash tables for names with, with, with DNS. DNS just works. We don't have flat names. We have dotted names, which are hierarchical. We replace IBC with PKI, and you know, immediately our life became better. The second thing is, uh, this is something that everybody knows, but I keep rediscovering it every five years. I should probably just have it etched on my you know, tattoo on my skin. All the bugs are in the interfaces. So each student develops one piece of code. It's perfectly fine and working, they say. <laughs> and then they hook it up to somebody else, and everything stops working. So the interfaces, despite our best efforts at documenting and so on and so forth, that's where all the bugs are, interfaces. Yeah. This is a fairly good recent problem. N people are needed to solve a solution, solve a problem, only N minus one will be available. One of them will be in class, taking an exam, sick, sleeping, having a cup of coffee, whatever. But <laughs> this is really a hard problem. You know, the system is, is fairly complex, there are many moving parts. And uh, and in the end, I had to resort to making the students stay in the lab and me staying in the lab and watching the door and not letting them leave. And then you could solve problems. And, if, and the last uh, thing we learned was PARC error 33. The PARC, they have something called error 33, which is your research depending on other people's research. So that's basically the same thing again. We initially started out depending on the success of Planet Lab and DHTs and IBC and so on. Uh, and it basically didn't work. So now we are <laughs> we've learned uh, we've learned this as well. So it's something that other people should probably take away. Single biggest problem is deployment. It's fine to develop technology. It's fine and it's fun. But getting people to use it is a different system altogether. And again, this I'm speaking to the preaching to the choir over here. 
uh, people are more, even if they're un, even if they're unhappy with what they have, they don't know the different kind of unhappiness they'll have with your stuff, right? They're just trading the known devil for the unknown devil, and the known devil is better. So that's the problem with deployment anywhere. So we are struggling with it. We've uh, we've had many people interested, ready to try it out, and something happens. Something always happens at the end, and so. Uh, as with many other technology, technology solutions, you know, we, we, we're facing this issue and uh, uh, we're going to keep trying. You know, that's basically what it is. So that's, 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 a, that's a problem we have. Well, I'm going to stop here and then can continue with some questions. So, started out with four goals, you know, low cost, uh, robustness, security, and flexibility. I think we meet the goals more or less. I mean, you can, you can argue about the details, but Basically, we met these details, uh, these these goals. Deployment is a problem, and uh, with that, I will stop and you know leave time for any questions. Thank you. I was uh, wondering what kinds of applications you've seen getting built, because I mean, from what you've described, you need it's a, it's a new model of development, right? You can't reuse what's already out there. Yeah, good point. So there are actually uh, essentially any application that is disconnection or delay tolerant. And the biggest one of this is email, right? You send an email, you don't really care whether it gets there in this instant or this day for, for most emails. And so that is the single biggest app. Personally, I believe that if you look at you know, villages and you know, this, the bus actually is delivering hopefully data between villages, right? Uh, I think uh, videos and actually photographs from one village to the other are potentially another uh, interesting app. Uh, dissemination of information, uh, one thing that one of my students is looking at essentially is to have uh, distribution of MP3s which can be played out or FM radio for community radio. It's another app which is quite interesting because you can actually both upload local content and distribute it to different places. So that's another potential app. Uh, you know, subscription to video feeds, entertainment, uh, education, so on, is another app. Uh, also, any transactional kind of thing. So you could have, uh, one of the things we did in Vishakhapatnam was electricity bill payment, where the money was collected locally, but the uh, app would record all the information, send it to the back end, which would then report it like a bill company, okay, the money has been paid. So that kind of transactional things, and uh, you know, bus reservations, train reservations, et cetera. So many of these government services are transaction-oriented, which lends itself very well to this model. Uh, of course, you can't use it for you know, voice or IP or any of these other things, but uh, there is a reasonably large number of things. Going forward, once, since we allow you to have links, which are, let's say, WiMAX and share it, you could, in fact, have uh, continuous apps as well. You know, web browsing could be done through this, uh, but this would not be the right way to do it necessarily, but you could, you could kind of hack it up. Hi, so you mentioned that deployment is a problem. So I was wondering uh, when and for how long have you deployed various versions of this? Okay. Uh, so the, the first one uh, was about two weeks, the, the, the one you did in the, the Vishakhapatnam. The second one, uh, not deployed. We, the, these guys in IIT Kharagpur have done something, but it's mostly in the lab. So we have deployments in labs, various places. I don't really count that as being a deployment. Uh, and the third version is not yet released, but uh, and the second one is going to go to Ghana as well. So that that presumably will last for a few months, but uh, yeah, that's the issue. So about the application, yeah. Uh, what do you have working on? You mentioned email and web browsing. Uh, okay. So uh, the application. So yeah, what do you have working right now? And if I'm a developer wanting to write an application, then. Yeah. How difficult is it for me to write an application? Or okay. like who so, can, mm -hmm. uh, so the the apps here working right now, uh, the the uh, email is the main one. We also have the YouTube upload and download. We call that uh, OTube, and uh, we we have essentially so the, the the file transfer. You know, you can think about it. The database synchronization is working. We also have uh, done but not integrated SMS. So you can take any file and add a .SMS. It'll go on SMS. So we can do that as well. In terms of developing new applications, essentially all you need to do is to write a file. And on the other end, read a file and do whatever processing you need to do on the other end, and on the proxy side. 
Okay. So the uh, to give, let me give an example of okay. We do that. Okay. Let me tell you how we dealt with the Flickr upload app because that's another app we did. So in the Flickr upload app, you take a photograph and it uploads it to Flickr, right? So what you do is you we, we did it on a cell phone just to show it off. So you take a photograph and you drop it into the directory, um, and then it, up, it it appears on a on a directory called you know, your username slash uh, OCMP proxy slash Flickr. Okay, slash upload. And then when the file appears, it calls a shell script. And the shell script is basically a PHP script, it takes the file, and it, is, uh, it has a username and password, which has to be set up prior to this. And it deposits it in Flickr using their uh, API. So that would be one thing. So in this case, I have to write two or three pieces of code, right? You have something to write on two the pieces. Cell phone, That's right. Something on the, on the other side, which. You have to write something script. on the client side, something on the server side. But the but basically you're reading and writing files, okay. you, and you can test those independently. So you you on the on the reading and writing files. So on the server side, you test how to take a file and drop it off where it's supposed to go. How to pick up stuff and drop it down into into your into your uh, download directory. And on the, similarly, on the client side, you have to read a file and write a file. So we you know the API is pretty well described. And as I said, a couple of us after seeing it, people are writing applications. So you can certainly try it hard. It's not that hard. So we, I should be a little bit more precise. We actually, you have to write two files. You have to write a file and something called a description file, which is the metadata. You know, where is it going? What is the information about it? Uh, your username that you want to use, potentially the password you want to use, all of these things. And uh, then the other side is going to actually interpret that and take care of it. Yes. Hi. Um, so you mentioned this kind of disconnect between the complexity required to write papers versus the simplicity required to actually uh, deploy these kinds of systems. Right. Um, so, what what's the right way to go about doing traditional technical? Re I mean, I know this is a hard question, and I'm not sure there's an answer, right? So, what what is the correct metric to apply to this kind of work to evaluate it from a computer science perspective? You know, mm -hmm. how how would you position this work to the computer science community? So, uh, I th I have sort of two approaches, which I would say. The first approach is uh, you build a simple system. You isolate a sub part of it which has some depth, and then you kind of you know throw the all your tools at your disposal to solve that sub problem, which may or may not be practically relevant, but is motivated from the same sub problem, and in, in the end adds some insight. So I give, give you an example of this. Uh, we looked at the problem of you know actually this is a pretty interesting problem in math. If you take a look at the situation over here, look at the proxy, right? The proxy has three gateways. All of these gateways can reach all these kiosks. So a piece of data arrives at the proxy, it wants to reach the topmost kiosk. Which gateway should it give it to? Well, it sort of depends. It depends on which bus is coming and when is it going to come. If it comes here first and then there later, maybe you should do it to that one or this one. It depends on whether you want to fairly share the link between the proxy and the gateway. It depends on whether the bus is full or not, et cetera. Right? It's quite a few competing objectives. So we looked at the problem in isolation, and we actually wrote a paper about it, which solves it using, as it turns out, optimization and network flow, and kind of you have you know, extensive simulations, analysis, all the math. How practical is it? Well, for our solution to work, the schedules have to be known precisely, which is impractical. So from the academic community, the networking community, if I want to publish a paper, I make some essentially uh, simplifying assumptions, solve the problem, you know, with the whole uh, nine yards you know, theory thrown behind it. But when I go implement it, I don't necessarily need all of that, right? But it still informs me. I kind of know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a hack over here, and I'm, I'm making these assumptions. This is what the real problem is. So in each of these things, we're able to identify sub-problems, which are uh, expressible mathematically. For example, over here, the kiosk gets some data. It needs to know whether to use the Wi-Fi, should it use the bus, should it use the uh, you know, SMS, what? What should I use? And for that, you can actually, it's another scheduling problem for which we use uh, linear optimization, right? So we can write a paper on linear optimization, and we have, which solves the problem. So that's the first approach, which is you have the big picture, you have the big system, and you carve off pieces of which can be analyzed in a sophisticated manner and publish. And it's, it's good computer science, I would say. The second approach, which is uh, to actually create a community which actually appreciates this kind of work, which uh, fairly broad, right? We're trying to solve very many different problems at the same time. We're trying to solve systems, we're trying to solve security, uh, sort of networking issues in terms of routing and so on, flow control. Um, 
and that's the ICTD community and it's, you know as you know it's a small but drawing and uh, that offers another venue. Uh, but, to, but I feel uh, that the traditional conferences, traditional areas are not super receptive to you know saying here's a big system. They don't get it. Yeah, I think that, that's a great answer. I mean, this is uh, it resonates with discussions I've had with other uh, other academics, computer science academics trying to work in this area. Right. And I think the problem still comes up is that even uh, maybe not for the ICTD community, but still I think it's an open question for the ICTD community. Um, what's the correct metric to evaluate work in that domain? Because I think a lot of the people who work in this space are not necessarily working in this space to do technically innovative things. They want to affect some kind of, they see the potential for technology and they want to use that potential to affect some kind of social or economic change. Mm -hmm. right? So when that's really your, your goal, it's often distracting to students to have that as their underlying goal but then have to at some point compromise and still present their work to a certain community that only appreciates technical complexity in some way, even within, for example, the ICTD community, right? So mm -hmm. ICTD community has this kind of division between people who are doing technical research and people who are doing social science research, and it's not clear that those two communities within the ICTD world are even, you know, working together in any really extended way, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I'm, yeah. I mean it's a perfectly valid point, and, uh, you know, we are sort of making it up as we go along, mm -hmm. right? At, the, at, the, at a higher level, you know, stepping back from the problem a little bit, I would say that, uh, it's commendable that people who are technically uh, you know, skilled and, you know, and could be working in any number of areas have chosen to work in this area. And certainly in my case, I could have published any number of papers on BGP routing, for example, or, or you know, flow control, or you name any classical uh, field uh, without having to struggle with this uh, you know, uh, and trying to talk government officials into deploying stuff. You know, it would be far easier for me to do that. And, you know, but, and, and the same holds true for many other people. And I can, you can probably name 10 other people who've taken that, that step. Uh, uh, so, you know, that's a good thing, I think, overall. Uh, now, that has unfortunately been evaluated using, you know, older metrics. We don't really have good uh, metrics to, uh, to say, okay, is this good work? Well, it's not been deployed anywhere, so it's not good work. You could certainly say that, and that would be a valid criticism, right? And certainly it's a source of intense frustration for me and my students to, to have to say, look, we did all this stuff, but it's not deployed anywhere, so what's the point, right? It, it kind of is frustrating. Uh, we, we don't have good metrics. We don't have good metrics, and I think the other problem which you mentioned, which you mentioned, which is this divergence between the social, the social and the technical parts. Uh, well, funnily enough, uh, you wouldn't even have this divergence unless there was ICTD community in the first place. Right. They'd be in different silos in different parts of the university, not even talking to each other. So the fact that you identify this as a problem is itself a good thing <laughs> uh, at a sufficiently high level of abstraction. Or at least the computer scientists recognize that problem, right? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think this is an area which is uh, gaining uh, momentum and, and uh, attraction. Uh, you know, let me give you an analogy of this, which, which, which is, I thought, about why is it happening, right? Why is this happening? Uh, if you look at every commodity, pretty much, the prices are going up over time, relative to inflation, relative to base level, whatever, you know, we've heard about wheat, but ICT is the only thing that gets cheaper over time. It's kind of funny, right? We are dealing with things that were very expensive 30 years ago, and now they're really, really cheap. So what that means is the power for them to do good for larger numbers of people, and the number of people they affect is growing, right? So. So it's like saying, I'm going to give you this brick, and this brick, next year the brick is going to cost you half the price, and the year after the brick is going to be an eighth of the price. You know, you'd be amazed. Wow, you know, bricks actually get expensive over time. But I'm going to give you the cell phone, and next year it's going to be half the price. The year after that, you know, it's going to be driven down to the price of sand, okay, which is what it mostly is. So uh, this is extraordinary. You know, we are essentially writing off of Moore's Law. And so the ability for, for ICT to affect people who have been traditionally deprived of communications technology is only going to increase so that, in that, that, that exposure of, of technology and development is going to increase just from Moore's law. And so that means as communities grow larger, you know, at some point there will be a certain amount of uh, expectation setting on what constitutes research. But we aren't there yet. No, I think in that, I'm sorry if anyone else has any questions. <laughs> But I think in, in that is actually the answer to the question of potentially of the metric also, right, in your response right there. So I, my, my personal position is that computer science 
is not used to studying phenomena at the scale that is relevant for this domain, right? Mm -hmm. So we started out with the Turing model of computation. We slowly grew to include networks and systems and graphics and other kinds of phenomena. And now we're just stopped at the kind of individual human boundary, right? I mean, that's human computer interaction, which mm -hmm. some might argue is in or not in computer science, right? But to study these kinds of phenomenon, we need, to, and especially when you're talking about adoption and impact and in terms of how it changes mm -hmm. socioeconomic processes, we need to change the scale at which we observe phenomenon. And that doesn't mean that there's no room for science or rigor in this area. There's definitely room for science or rigor. It's just a matter of observing phenomena at the correct scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also once you cross from objective to subjective, it becomes difficult, right? I mean, if you're going to, somebody's going to say, well, this computer goes at one million instructions per second, that's objective. If this one says, I was more satisfied with email over this versus satisfied with email over that, or I'm more satisfied today because yesterday, well, maybe yesterday I had a stomachache, and actually I didn't, so I'm more satisfied. It's kind of subjective. Then the evaluation criteria are not obvious. And, and you know, mean opinion scores, things like that kind of get hairy. So, so that's certainly a problem as well. But anyway, that's a very valid point. You're, you're, the boundary is expanding. 